Uh, all right. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to our next uh, geophysics and tectonics seminar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm happy uh, to announce that our speaker this week uh, is Christy Haney, from, who's now at the USGS uh, as a uh, uh, Mendenhall postdoctoral fellow. Um, and she'll be talking a bit about subduction dynamics uh, in South Central Alaska. So thank you for being with us, Christy, and take it away. Great. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Hope you're doing well. And I'd, I'd really like to thank Keeley for the invitation to present um, at the University of Kentucky International Seminar Series. Um, there's been so many good talks. Um, and I really think that during these uh, unusual times, it's been wonderful that the community is able to come together virtually once a week and have some really great discussions. Um, yeah, so as Keeley said, I'm currently a postdoc at the United States Geological Survey, um, but today I'm going to be discussing some of my PhD work, which was done with uh, Margaret Jadamak at the University of Buffalo, SUNY. And so um, for this work, I ran a suite of 3D um, numerical models um, of sub the natural subduction system, Alaska, um, where I looked at how a long-term coupling along the subduction interface, interface excuse me, or plate boundary um, affects the dynamics of that system. And you'll hear me refer to this long-term coupling as a, a tectonic coupling. And so specifically, we'll be looking at the effects of uniform coupling um, along the entire plate boundary, as well as when we impose a local increase in tectonic coupling um, or a local increase in viscosity um, within the region of flat slab subduction in Alaska. Um, and so while this study is really focused on the Alaska subduction zone um, um, with, the, with the ultimate goal of trying to better understand the drivers of uh, the, I guess, deformation in that system, this was also in part motivated by the complexities um, of the subduction zone interface. Um, and so there have been several uh, rock uh, studies, field studies of exhumed uh, rocks and subduction channels, as you see in this figure here. Um, that, uh, that have looked at subduction zone interface properties. Um, and there's this really great review by Babout and uh, uh, Penance and Dorland 2015. Um, where, and they have this nice cross section here where they kind of illustrate as we move down the subducting plate, um, what, what that subduction channel or, or interface would look like. And you can see that um, there's really a lot going on here. It's, it's quite structurally complex, right? We have uh, various rocks, right? Rocks from the upper plate, rocks from the downgoing plate, um, as well as the accretionary prism um, coming together. Um, these blue lines here are, are marking some, some possible paths of fluid flow um, as water is being released from the downgoing plate. And so it's this really like, big compilation of various rheological and petrological properties, right? Compilation of sedimentary, mafic, ultramafic rocks. So very complex, right? Especially um, in terms of uh, the, the structure. And there's also been uh, many different studies um, across the board that have attempted to quantify the shear stress um, as well as the coefficient of friction of the subduction interface. Um, and there's this nice study by Lamb and Davis, 2003, where they did a simple force balance um, of the subduction, uh, I guess, to determine the, the shear stress along the subduction interface of the Peru and Chile trench, and found that a variability in shear stress along the interface is required to balance the buoyancy contrasts uh, between the trench and the height of the Andes Mountains. Um, and so they found that there is this highest uh, coupling or highest amount of shear stress along the central segment of the trench, which um, values around 50 to 55 megapascals, with shear stress decreasing um, as you move away from that central segment. Um, and, they, and they did some correlations and found that this area of high shear stress correlated with an area where they didn't observe a lot of uh, sediments um, or at the trench. Um, there's also been some analog models. So this is a study by Duarte et al. 2015, where they have an analog model and empirical relationships um, based on those models um, that found as you increase uh, shear stress, then we get a decrease in uh, subducting plate velocities, um, where they found that shear stress is less than 35 megapascals. So in this, uh, this area where we have this gray box, um, best matched or best fit observed plate motions. And so their study really implies that 
a low or a medium mechanical coupling of the subduction zone interface uh, was globally or was necessary for us to match these global plate motions. Um, and then there's some other studies like um, such as rock friction, rock friction, excuse me, experiments um, from Byer Lee that suggested some of the highest values in shear stress and uh, coefficient of friction up to values of 1,000 megapascals or about 0.8 um, for that coefficient there. And so these experiments, analytical calculations, and models are really suggesting. Um, quite a wide range um, in, in the strength and properties of the subduction zone interface. So going back to observations, um, so here I'm just looking at some geophysical observations. I really love this electrical resistivity study by Naif et al. 2016, um, where they're looking at the Middle, Middle America Trench. Um, and we can clearly see um, some nice outer rights faulting um, of the downgoing cocos plates um, where seawater enters the slab. And there's this, uh, I guess, a uh, zone of water rich sediment here that's subducting along with the downgoing plate. And we have some possible fluid pathways, um, right? Where on the surface we're seeing some fluid seeps. Um, and so this is an area where, you know, water is being released. And so the release of water um, from the downgoing slab um, can allow for the existence of weak hydrous minerals, um, such as talc, right? And so observations are again suggesting that, that this zone um, is inherently weak. And of course, with um, subduction zones, right, and the megathrust hosting the largest earthquakes on Earth, there have been many, many studies looking at the correlation between megathrust earthquakes, most notably great earthquakes, um, as well as coupling along the subduction interface. Um, there have been some studies that have suggested a correlation between great earthquakes and a strong or highly coupled of subduction interface. Um, some work by Schultz um, et al, as well as uh, Ruff, uh, uh, Kanamori, um, and so forth. Um, and they suggest that such a strong coupling along the megathrust exerts, or, sorry, occurs where there is a large uh, normal force. Um, and so there's some analog models by Spurt et al, 2008, that uh, demonstrate that quite nicely, where they have subduction of a buoyant oceanic plateau and their modeling um, suggests that we see an increase in strain being transferred to the upper plate. And so this can occur in areas uh, where we have um, not only subduction of buoyant features like plateaus or seamounts, but also where we have subduction um, of, of young seafloor or even flat or sub-horizontal slabs. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, though, it has also been, uh, there's also been studies um, that find a correlation with uh, high magnitude earthquakes and low coefficient of uh, friction, so uh, weak subduction zone interfaces. Um, so studies by Scholl et al., I think uh, 2015, um, but also one I'm highlighting here by Gao and Wang in 2014, um, where they studied heat flow data in several subduction zones. Um, and they tried to use that to determine strength of the fault. So here they're looking at the coefficient of friction and maximum moment magnitude of earthquakes in various subduction zones. Um, and they, they found a correlation between higher magnitude earthquakes and a lower um, coefficient of friction. And so from these earthquake correlation studies, um, as well as the previous studies on shear stress um, and coefficient of friction, it seems that there's still a lot of uncertainty and a lot that we don't know still, right? So there are so many outstanding questions uh, regarding the subduction interface. And this is kind of my, uh, my, my uh, virtual whiteboard, if you will, of, of just some of these outstanding questions, um, right? Like, is it always weak? How does, you know, coupling, how does it vary with time? Um, does it vary, you know, locally within a subduction zone along, along strike, you know, along dip of the slab? Um, you know, how can we best test and quantify this? Um, and pretty much the overarching question that I'm trying to understand here is how does this affect, right, the overall 3D dynamics within the subduction system? Um, and I think a, a good place to, to start addressing some of these questions um, is, is via numerical modeling of a natural subduction system. Um, and, and Alaska actually seems to be a pretty good place to get started with that. And so Alaska is marked um, by oblique subduction of the Pacific Plate beneath the North American Plates. 
Um, here we have a range of seafloor age where we have younger seafloor around 30 to 20 million years old subducting along the eastern end of the, the plate boundary with seafloor age increasing to around 60, 70 million years old as we move west towards the Aleutians. These white lines here, these are the 40 kilometer uh, contour intervals of the slab model, slab E115 from Jadamak and Bill in 2010. And there's quite a bit of variability um, in the geometry, the 3D geometry of that subducting slab, uh, where along the Aleutians um, in the Alaska Peninsula, we have a more normally dipping slabs around 60 to 20, uh, 40 degrees. And as we move towards South Central Alaska, uh, we have a, a flat segment of the slab there. So if we now zoom into South Central Alaska, um, which is the primary location of today's talk, uh, we can really see um, how extensive that flat slab really is. So it's extending over 300 kilometers from the plate boundary. Um, and this model also shows kind of a nice uh, rounded um, apex um, to that downgoing uh, segment of the flat slab. Um, this area also coincides um, with subduction and collision of an oceanic plateau, the Yakutat Oceanic Plateau, whose extent here I've delineated by this purple polygon. Um, so there's been uh, tomography studies uh, by Eberhardt and Phillips, 2006, um, as well as some other seismic studies up north, uh, Ferris et al., 20, uh, sorry, 2003, um, that have imaged this plateau to sub subducting to depths of around 150 kilometers. And in terms of the topography and bathymetry, uh, we really see that Alaska is marked by this really broad diffuse zone of deformation um, with a uh, topography kind of following um, northwest uh, along with that flat slab um, to, to just north of this large intercontinental fault, um, the Denali Fault, um, or you'll commonly hear me refer to it as the Denali Fault shear zone in our models. Right, and we all know that Alaska is very seismically active. Um, I'm always amazed when I look at the recent seismic activity using the USGS uh, Map and List web app. Um, and so, yeah, very quickly, this, uh, this map has been recently updated by the Hazards Development or HazDev team, um, a team I overlap with at the USGS. So be sure to check out the updates there. Um, but yeah, just looking at seven, you know, over seven day periods at all magnitudes of earthquakes, there's always a lot going on. Um, and always a wide variety of magnitudes, right? Um, just last week, right, we had that 7.8 earthquake um, along the edge of the Smedi segment near the Shumagin uh, Gap, excuse me. Um, but there's, um, of course, some very well-studied events um, that have taken place here, um, such as the 2002 um, Denali Fault earthquakes, which occurred along the central segment of the Denali Fault, um, this is magnitude 6.7 and a 7.9 event. Um, and of course, um, the very well known uh, 1964 Great Alaska earthquake. So this was a magnitude 9.2, which was the second largest earthquake recorded by modern seismometers. And it occurred um, in the region where we have uh, flat slab subduction uh, within the Prince William Sound. And so um, this polygon here um, is the approximate rupture path um, that I've uh, drawn out. Um, and so for associated with this event, so we have two distinct ruptures, um, which I've indicated here by these two um, hatchers. And so we find that the rupture um, extended southwest, um, where Stouter and Bollinger um, suggested that, you know, it was a multiple asperity rupture um, with the dominant asperity occurring um, where we had our main event within the Prince William Sound area, um, and then a smaller asperity um, in Kodiak Island. And so this event has traditionally been interpreted in terms of the relative motion of the Pacific plate beneath the North American plate with primary rupture um, within this area of, of flat slab subduction, um, where that flat slab is producing high interplate coupling and a high coefficient of friction um, compared to that second um, rupture patch. Um, geodetic, geodetic modeling of this area um, also suggests uh, variability in subduction interface coupling. So we're looking at a, a study here by Zweck and Frey Mueller, 2002, um, where they've denoted high coupling in red and low coupling in blue. Um, and they found that um, we have the highest amount of coupling um, 
in South Central Alaska coinciding um, with the flat slab and subduction of the buoyant Yakutat Oceanic Plateau, um, again with coupling a decreasing southwest. And so it really seems that subduction interface coupling in South Central Alaska um, varies a long strike. Um, and so yeah, interface coupling, you know, it does have important tectonic implications, right? But how much does it affect the long-term tectonic deformation? And how can we begin to tease out the various forces um, within the subduction system that affect the overall dynamics? And so previous 3D uh, geodynamic models of Alaska from Jadamac and Bill in 2010 and Jadamac et al. 2013 began to address this. Um, so a few things they looked at um, in the 2010 study uh, was geometry of the downgoing plate or the subducting slab. We have model slab E115 that does not contain slab in this uh, northeastern segment, whereas slab model slab E325 um, does contain a bit of the wrangle slab um, in the northeast. And then the 2013 study, um, they look at the effects of including um, the Denali fault shear zone um, into the numerical models. And so um, what these models showed was that um, using the slab geometry, um, slab E115, that does not include this segment here, and also incorporating um, the Denali fault shear zone into the models, um, they're really important for, um, for producing independent motion of the Wrangell microplate, um, as well as uplift along the central Alaska range. Um, and they also found here that uh, a weaker tectonic coupling with the viscosity of 10 to the 20 pascal seconds along the entire plate boundary um, best fit Nouvel 1A subducting plate motion. And so here we build upon uh, the 3D geodynamic models of Alaska um, by testing lengths of that Denali fault shear zone. So um, the western extent of the Denali fault, um, it's not very well constrained um, due to a lack of cover um, um, as well as remoteness. Um, so we look at um, increasing length um, of that fault and also testing uh, various viscosities um, along the Denali fault or over five order of a magnitude from 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 21 Pascal seconds. Um, then we also look here at um, how that how the effects of the Denali fault viscosity um, and length are, are affected when we have uniform coupling along that entire plate boundary, as well as when we impose a local increase in tectonic coupling within that area um, of flat slab subduction. And so these models, um, they're geographically referenced. Um, so they include all of mainland Alaska, as well as part of the central Aleutians, um, as well as a little bit of Western Canada. Um, we have variable resolution in the models around uh, two uh, kilometers um, within South Central Alaska with resolution uh, coarsening as we move away in each direction from that area of interest. The models do include an overriding plate with variable thickness, a subducting, subducting plate, and we're using that slab uh, E115 model um, that I showed in uh, the previous slide. Um, and the models also include an upper mantle and lower mantle down to depths of 1,500 kilometers. And again, ultimately what we're asking here is what, what is driving deformation in South Central Alaska? Um, and so we're, we're gonna really pay more attention or look more closely towards the flat slab um, and the Denali fault shear zone, specifically investigate, right? Length and strength um, of that shear zone and how it modulates motion of the upper plate, specifically motion of the lithosphere between the trench and the Denali fault, um, which is something that you'll hear me refer to as the Wrangell microplate. And you'll see it commonly denoted as uh, WMP throughout this talk. And um, we're also going to be testing the effects of the uniform and the variable uh, subduction interface coupling um, in order to, uh, to, I guess, in order to understand the dynamics of the system. And so to fully address how well each of the inclusions um, of these various complexities into the model affects the system, we compare our results um, with post-seismic corrected GPS velocities. Um, and we also look at some offset across that Denali fault shear zone. And so on these long time scales, right, in terms of millions of years, it's appropriate to model Earth as a viscous fluid. Um, and 
we do that using SITCOM CEU, um, which we did through the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics, or CIG. Um, and so here we're solving for a viscous flow of the mantle, assuming an incompressible fluid with a high Prandtl number. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the instantaneous solution. Um, so pretty much the present day balance of forces within the subduction system when we're solving for a conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Uh, we apply free slip boundary conditions on all sides of the model. Um, and these models are dynamic. So we are not prescribing any velocities. And instead it is the thermal structure, the Alaska 3D 1.0 thermal structure that is driving the flow in these simulations. And just a quick note on the viscosity use in the model. We are using a composite viscosity based on the contributions from both diffusion and dislocation creep um, based on the flow, wet, uh, flow laws of uh, olivine um, from Hearth and Colstead 2003. Okay, so first we can uh, take a look at results from models that um, apply a uniform uh, long-term tectonic coupling along that plate boundary shear zone. Um, and so we test a, a upper bound of viscosity of 10 to the 20 pascal seconds and also 10 to the 21 pascal seconds uniformly across the plate boundary. Um, so the Denali fault um, in, this, in all of these models um, is a, a feature that goes through the entire um, upper plate. So it's a lithospheric um, scale feature. And we test viscosities uh, of that feature from 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 21 pascal seconds. Um, and as a reminder, we're looking at the, the two various lengths of that feature. So the primary results um, are shown here. We're on the y-axis, we have our plate boundary shear zone viscosity. On the x-axis, we have viscosity of the Denali fault. We have our long fault model shown by the solid line and the short model shown by the dashed line. And the size of these circles here is giving the size of the horizontal velocity magnitude um, within uh, the lithosphere between the trench and the Denali fault. So within that Wrangell microplate. And what these models show is that as we increase viscosity of the plate boundary, we increase speed or horizontal velocity of the ring of microplates. And likewise, as we uh, decrease viscosity of the Denali fault, we increase speed of that Wrangell microplate as well. And so our models that are producing the fastest motion of that uh, microplate are models that have a strong plate boundary uh, viscosity or high viscosity um, and also models that have a low viscosity of the Denali faults. And so these models um, are producing speeds of around 9.3 millimeters per year. Um, so these models are, are, are you know, doing a, a decent job at st uh, starting to kind of understand um, what's contributing um, to upper plate deformation. Um, but compared to the post seismic corrected GPS speed at that location, we're still around 10 millimeters um, per year, a little low. Um, so now we're going to look at the next uh, series of models um, where we take what we learned from those previous models. Um, so we're using a long Denali fault and a Denali fault with a low viscosity, 10 to the 17 pascal seconds. Um, and now we're going to just locally increase the viscosity um, or tectonic coupling within that area of flat oceanic plateau subduction. So from between 150 to 140 uh, degrees longitude. And so what that looks like is that we're keeping viscosity um, at 10 to the 20 pascal seconds until we get to that region of increased coupling. And within that region, uh, we increase um, coupling to either 10 to the 21 pascal seconds, 10 to the 22 pascal seconds, or 10 to the 23 pascal seconds. All right, so here again, we're looking at model predicted horizontal velocity magnitude um, in this uh, map on the top left, we have higher values um, in reds and orange and lower values given by these shades of blue. Um, on the figure on the bottom here, we're looking at horizontal velocity magnitude on the y-axis and our ratio of viscosity um, along the plate boundary to viscosity within that area, see, within that area of, of flat slab subduction. Um, and we're looking at velocity um, within this point here, the interior Wrangell microplate. And so our models um, with 10 to the zero indicated by that here, these are models that have uniform coupling. They're plotted here just for reference, where we have our model that does not contain a Denali fault. 
And then our models um, on this side of the, the plot are models that have a one order, two order, or three order magnitude uh, increase in viscosity um, within that region of flat slab subduction. Um, and what we find here is that as we increase um, tectonic coupling, specifically when we increase uh, just locally the coupling, uh, we find an increase in horizontal velocity magnitude of that interior wrangle block microplate point. Um, again, we can do a little more comparison um, to our models that have uniform coupling along the plate boundary. And so these models now on the x-axis, we have the viscosity of the Denali fault shear zone. So those various viscosities we tested, uniform coupling of 10 to the 20 plotted in black and 10 to the 21 Pascal seconds is plotted here in gray. Um, and, and I guess one thing that I like to point out is just this, the range of values on the y-axis in these two plots. So you can see that in our models with uniform coupling, we're getting max values of eight to just over nine millimeters per year. And then as soon as we introduce this local increase in tectonic coupling, we're seeing about a threefold increase um, in velocities of the interior Ringel microplate. So going up to around 22 millimeters per year. So in this last plot here, um, we're looking now at velocities um, offshore. So the diamonds um, correspond to this point just north of the trench, um, so some point in the southern Wrangell microplate. Um, and the square um, is giving the location of the offshore Pacific plate, which, sorry, it's not on this extent here, but it's just um, a little south from what we're seeing in this map. And I, I forgot to mention earlier, but we do have some observations plotted here on the y-axis. Um, so we have our Nuvel 1A plate motions um, around 50 millimeters per year. Um, and then GPS data, the southern point, the Wrangell block um, is from around 35, 36 millimeters per year. Um, and since I forgot to mention it, um, our GPS data within the interior point um, is around 19 millimeters per year. And so looking again at these offshore values, um, what we find is that as we locally increase the tectonic coupling, we're decreasing velocities. And so, um, yeah, that makes sense, right? So as soon as we're adding more resistance to subduction, so more uh, viscosity between the area between the downgoing and the overriding plates, we're increasing the resistance to subduction. And so we're slowing things there down. Um, and so, uh, our model, um, we find that the model that has a one order of magnitude increase um, is actually a, a decent model in that it's able to produce fast motions of the interior Wrangell microplates while also maintaining a minimum reduction in downgoing plate speeds. Um, and so this model is found to kind of best match um, um, these various observations that we have plotted here. Um, and just one um, implication that comes from looking at these um, velocities here from models with and without that local increase in tectonic coupling is that by just imposing right, a local increase um, in subduction interface coupling, we're greatly affecting um, the motions of both the overriding and the downgoing plates. And so this has um, implications for models of global plate motion and, and perhaps even plate reconstructions. So here we're looking at a more quantitative comparison um, to that post-seismic corrected GPS observations, um, where again, our models with that one order magnitude of, of increase in viscosity is producing a better fit to these GPS um, observations. Um, so here we have our model predictive velocity arrows in red and our post-seismic corrected GPS velocities in blue. And both of these velocity fields are showing um, overall well, northwest motion, as well as a little bit of counterclockwise rotational motion of the lithosphere between the trench and the Denali Fault. Um, and if we look at the difference in direction or azimuth between the GPS and the model uh, velocity fields, so over um, in this plot here, we're looking at um, that azimuthal difference. So lower differences are in reds and yellow, uh, orange, excuse me, with higher differences in grays and blues. And we can see in our area where we have that uh, local tectonic coupling in our flat slab, the models are, are doing a pretty good job aligning with the GPS velocity field. So we're mostly within 20 degrees. Um, um, to those observations. Um, and we find that this model is, is contributing about an, up to 
percent to these observed GPS speeds. <clears throat> Um, so here um, we're looking at um, oil or pole, um, oil or poles, excuse me, um, for our models as well as a few observations. And so with those models and GPS observations, both suggesting um, this like coherent motion of that Wrangell uh, microplate um, that's semi-independent from North America, um, we can uh, calculate some poles of rotation for that lithosphere. And so here, I know there's a lot um, on this plot, so I'll try to go through it um, uh, point by point. Um, so we have our models that have uniform um, coupling and that tested the Denali fault shear zone viscosity plotted by the black and these gray circles over here. For reference, we have models without a Denali fault shear zone plotted by these pink dots. Uh, circles here that have the bimodal black, black and gray, these are our models um, the, the, the newest uh, suite of models that have our variable tectonic coupling, so that local increase in coupling within the area of flat subduction. Um, we have our, the pole calculated um, from that post-seismic corrected GPS velocity field um, that we just saw on the previous slide. Um, and then we also have this poll um, from the literature, so from the neotectonic and geodetic study um, from Fletcher 2002. Um, and so just looking at these poles, um, these poles were calculated from our model predictive velocity field or the GPS field um, using the Euler pole calculator from Godarzy et al. 2014. And we see that all of our models are, pre are predicting Euler poles um, that are southwest of the Alaska Peninsula, where our models um, with the local increase in tectonic coupling are producing poles that lie between our GPS observations and also between um, uh, that neotectonic um, poll from Fletcher 2002. On the right here, we're looking at our model predicted velocity field. Um, these are arrows um, from our best fit model plotted in red. And then we also have our back calculated velocity field um, from the Euler pole calculator. Um, so this is the velocity field that is determined um, when we give um, that the calculator, if you will, um, the location of the Euler pole. Um, and what we see here is that the models um, and this back calculated velocity field are matching pretty well, um, correlating very well with each other within that interior part um, of the Wrangell microplates. Um, and then we see some deviations from that as you move westward. Um, so this is suggesting um, that the this lithosphere between the trench and the Denali Fault um, is behaving more like a, a perfectly rigid microplate, if you will, uh, within the interior parts um, um, of the Ringel microplate um, with uh, rigid plate behavior deviating westward. Um, we also calculated um, a, a measure of plateness, um, so given here by P. Um, this is just used um, to determine how closely the model predicted uh, microplate speed uh, matches our GPS speed. So a plateness of one here suggests that the microplate is perfectly rigid, right, with the model velocities accurately matching our GPS observations. Um, and our models um, with a local increase in tectonic coupling are producing the highest values of plateness, so up to 0 0.87. Um, just for reference, models without the Denali fault shear zone uh, produce the lowest values of plateness. 0.04, um, and models with the uniform coupling uh, produce values of around 0 0.4. There we go. Um, and so if we break the velocity um, along the leading edge of the Wrangell microplate um, into Denali fault parallel and Denali fault perpendicular components, um, we're here, we're looking um, at the velocity magnitude on a normalized scale. So I'm just trying to show where we have fast motion in red and slower motions in blue. Um, we can see that we have fault parallel motion dominating along the eastern segment of that fault, which is uh, parallel um, to the slab geometry shown here now by these gray lines. Um, and that parallel motion decreases westward. Um, and if we look at the fault perpendicular motion, we see that um, we have that uh, fault perpendicular motion is really dominating along that central segment of the Denali fault. Um, so this is where we kind of see that bends, you know, change in geometry of the fault, um, as well as this um, kind of bends in the flat slab, right? And so this area is really kind of oblique um, to the subducting plate there. 
um, here, um, I calculated a long-term uh, difference in motion across the Denali fault. So taking that fault parallel motion along the leading edge of the microplate and fault parallel motion along the inboard North American plate and looking at that difference in that um, to get this kind of long-term uh, differential motion across the Denali fault shear zone. And, and what we find here is that we're having a faster a differential motion, again, along that kind of central segment where the fault begins to bend. Um, so around 145 degrees longitude is where we're seeing some of the fastest values there. Um, and it's quite interesting because we look at observed uh, Denali fault uh, slip rates, and sorry, I forgot to cite, this is a compilation from Hausler et al, 2017. Uh, we see similarities in the overall pattern. Um, so we are seeing some of those highest uh, values occurring along the central segment, again, at around 145 longitude, with values decreasing westward, right, and eastward as you move away from that area. And so in terms of the role of the flat slab, we find that the flat slab in South Central Alaska is really driving that uh, wrinkle microplate motion, as well as motion across the Denali Fault. And so the flat slab um, and the, the slab pool force, right, the negative buoyancy, the slab is really kind of pooling the wrinkle microplate along its path of subduction um, and into the Denali Fault, right, where the Denali Fault um, is kind of resisting um, and guiding motion of that microplate. And so when we have more coupling, more tectonic coupling in this region, we're allowing that flat slab to transfer more of its horizontal motion to the upper plate. And so these models suggest that the overall mechanics of this system um, is really driven by that slab and the tectonic coupling of that slab and the flat slab to the upper wrinkle microplates. So here we're looking at um, various cross sections taken from um, southeast. So line C, C prime, uh, right through the 1964 Great Alaska earthquake, um, moving northwards or really uh, northwest um, to line F to F prime, which is just past um, the Denali Fault. And what we see here um, is that clearly, even just looking at it on the map, the upper plate um, in South Central Alaska um, is the Wrangell upper plate. So in this area, right, we have that flat slab. Um, it's highly coupled to the upper plate. And as we move uh, northwest, we see that the slab begins to, to descend further into the mantle, right? The dip of the slab begins to steepen. Um, and now um, the North American plate um, becomes the upper plate. And so it's really that tectonic coupling of the flat slab to the wrangle plate, not the flat slab to the North American plate, that is driving um, the relative motion, right, within this wrangle microplate Denali fault system. And so this is really suggesting that the tectonics in South Central Alaska is dominated by three lithospheric plates, the Pacific plate, the wrangle microplate, and the North American plate. And so with our models, um, as well as those uh, long-term uh, GPS motions suggesting that the wrangle plate behaves as this coherent block, right, that it has semi-independent motion um, from North America, you, this is really consistent with this microplate behavior. Um, and something that's quite interesting is just, you know, looking at these three velocity fields, so post-seismic corrected GPS, model velocity field in red, and that back calculated Euler pole velocity field in blue, um, it's interesting to note that they all show this kind of westward decrease um, in velocity, um, which we suggest is implying um, a diffuse, um, uncertain western boundary for this microplate. And so, you know, this boundary, it, it's not very well defined in part due to, again, remoteness, right, and cover. Um, so some additional observations, perhaps from some field studies, uh, would be really important for better constraining this boundary, um, as well as that Euler pole of rotation. And so perhaps this microplate um, can be viewed more as an incipient uh, microplate uh, with three well-defined sides. And so the 1964 earthquake, so going back to that quickly, um, this has traditionally been viewed in terms of the relative motion of the Pacific plate beneath the North American plate, um, where we saw that um, 
I guess, rupture initiated in this area of, of high coupling, right, where we have the flat slab and then and suggested as a large coefficient of friction. Um, but as we saw in the previous slides, this system is really dominated, right, by those three plates. And so um, the, it's very clear here that the epicenter of the 1964 earthquake occurred within this Wrangell microplate. Um, and, and we know that motion from our models of this microplate is really controlled by the viscosities, right, of these bounding shear zones, the Denali fault um, and the plate boundary shear zones. And so um, you know, these models are suggesting that you know, the upper plate involved in the Great Alaska earthquake as well as other earthquakes um, in South Central Alaska along the megathrust um, is the Wrangell microplate, not the North American plate. And within this microplate system, our models are predicting, right, a westward decrease in shear along the leading edge of the Wrangell microplate, um, which correlates with a uh, westward increase in fault perpendicular compression um, our observed Denali fault slip rates, um, you know, these are also low in the east and higher in the west, um, suggesting that perhaps the eastern segment um, of the fault and leading edge of the microplate can move more easily um, than that central segment of the fault um, where we observe more convergence. And again, along this area, we have uh, flat slab subduction. We have a lot of seismicity, um, so a little hard to see, sorry, but it, we, these are um, earthquakes shown by these light gray dots here. So we have seismicity trending all along that region of flat subduction, right? We had our great Alaska earthquake here. We had two big earthquakes in 2002, right? Strike slip and, um, and a, a, a re, an oblique uh, reverse um, component. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, transpressional deformation in this area. Um, and, oops, sorry. I accidentally hit the wrong button there. Transpressional deformation in this area. Um, and if we look at um, the topography, again, we could, you know, this is a very broad zone of deformation. And so we do have this like a lot of mountain building occurring along this path of subduction, uh, right? From from the trench to that bend in the Denali Fault. And so um, what we propose here is that there is this zone of compression extending um, from the plate boundary to that bend in the Denali Fault. Um, and, so, and so the flat slab and the coupling of the flat slab to the overriding plate is really driving and pulling that Wrangell microplate into this bend, right? Into this, this buttress of the Denali Fault. Um, and so, some of that you know resistance is then being can possibly be transferred from that bend in the fault back to the mega thrust back to the plate boundary which could possibly increase interplate coupling um, and strain and so we find that this bend in the fault um, acts to resist escape um, if you will of this microplate system suggesting that the tectonic regime of south central alaska is really dominated by oblique subduction <laughs> of the flat slab, right, which is then driving that escape tectonics of this microplate, where we have this great earthquake situated within this domain of resisted escape. And an implication from this um, study is that there seems to be some connectivity or uh, intrinsic coupling uh, between motion along the megathrust um, and motion along that intercontinental uh, shear zone, the Denali Fault. Um, and so intercontinental shear zones may play a key role um, in long-term tectonics. Um, and this is something um, that this supports findings from analytical and also analog models of four arc slivers. And so four arc slivers, they occur um, according to Girard in about 50% of modern subduction zones. Um, and so and these happen in areas where we have oblique convergence of the downgoing plate, as well as an active large intercontinental strike slip fault in the upper plate. Um, so in Alaska, um, that sliver fault would be the Denali fault. Um, there have been uh, generalized models, um, Hawk and Davis 2010, um, that suggest that the strain partitioning um, can occur with co uh, convergent obliquities up to around 60 degrees. Um, and our models here, the geodynamic models of Alaska, they have convergence obliquity of around 24 degrees. Um, and so this suggests that we can apply our model results um, to other subduction zones with 4x sliver. Um, an example of one of those um, is Sumatra. 
um, where our sliver fault here um, is this great Sumatra fault. And so um, our geodynamic simulations suggest that the accumulation of strain um, that, that led to this uh, great earthquake in 2004, um, a magnitude 9.2 to 9.3, um, may reflect the dynamics of this entire four arc sliver system, um, as well as the 3D geometric relationships um, between the slab, between the megathrust, and between that four arc sliver fault. Um, and so in future models, um, of earthquake prediction, hazard assessment, and, and even when just interpreting the mechanics of great earthquakes, um, these studies and these four sliver studies suggest that, that intercontinental shear zones um, may be something, may play an important role for hazard assessment and is something that should uh, possibly be considered um, in these studies. And so this is just a map that I've been starting here, kind of showing um, some great earthquakes worldwide um, by the yellow stars um, in areas where we have four arc slivers. So just something to start thinking about. All right, um, so to summarize, um, here we use 3D geodynamic models of the natural subduction system in Alaska to explore how tectonic coupling affects deformation. In our first suite of models, um, we showed that the low viscosity um, shear zone for the Denali fault, uh, viscosity of 10 to the 17 pascal seconds, as well as that longer fault model um, and a uniform tectonic coupling um, of 10 to the 21 pascal seconds, produce the fastest motion of the Wrangell microplate. Um, then by locally increasing tectonic coupling uh, within that region of flat oceanic plateau subduction, um, the models produce velocities that were uh, more comparable to our GPS observations, um, suggesting that a small region, um, perhaps a region as big as an oceanic plateau, um, applying an increase in coupling there can cause significant changes in plate motion. Um, models further showed that motion of the Wrangell microplate um, is governed by the viscosity of those bounding shear zones, so the viscosity of the plate boundary um, and the Denali fault, um, but also the geometry of these features, right, implying that there may be some connectivity um, between motion um, along the interface and motion along the Denali fault shear zone, um, suggesting um, as does forex sliver studies, that intercontinental shear zones may be important when assessing subduction interface hazards. Um, and just a, a side note, while the Agakatat Oceanic Plateau, depicted in purple here, was not included in any of the simulations presented here today, um, incorporating the realistic geometry of the Yakutat Oceanic Plateau into these simulations um, will be the next suite of models. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that changes the overall dynamics. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you. I clap for everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Christy? Uh, Joyce, then would you like to unmute? I see you. Oh, please help me ask. Okay. Uh, how exactly, sorry, I missed that part. Uh, how exactly do you control the viscosity imposed for the tectonic coupling uh, and the Denali shear zone? Um, uh, you had uniform viscosity in the earlier paper and then variable viscosity later. Are they specified to be a region with a prescribed uh, viscosity that you showed? Um, yeah, so how we, and maybe I'll go back to a model setup um, figure two, um, cross section. Um, so yeah, so we have these weak zones um, in the models. Um, I'm not sure that's the best photo, but we can do, this one might be good. Um, so we have in, weak zones in the models that are pre-described. Um, so for our plate boundary shear zone, um, that one follows the, the trace of the plate boundary from Bird 2003. Um, and then for our Denali fault shear zone, that is following the mapped trace um, of the Denali fault um, based on uh, geologic field studies um, from Plathger and others. And so um, what we do in our models is we just um, set an upper bound of viscosity um, within those regions. Um, so we just say, um, within our plate boundary weak zone, uh, we'll have an upper uh, 
but bound in viscosity of 10 to the 20 pascal seconds, for example. Um, and then we'll run that model, right? And then in our next suite of models, we'll change the upper bound of viscosity um, to 10 to the 21 pascal seconds. Um, hopefully that answers the um, question. I think so. It's helpful to see the figure again, at least for me. Okay. Yes, she says thank you. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Oh, uh, Olivia uh, Helprin, would you like to? Oh, I'll ask. Sorry, let me read the questions first. <laughs> How thick or mature does a fault shear zone need to be uh, to consider uh, it to possess a distinct viscosity from the surrounding regions? Oh, that's a really good question. Huh. Well, I can, I can talk about um, the thickness in our models. Um, so the Denali fault um, shear zone in our models um, is modeled as a 40 kilometer wide um, feature. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of, of observations, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's something that I probably need to to read up on a little bit. Um, I know there's a lot of debate regarding the um, extent or depth of these shear zones. So some studies suggest um, that um, they extend all the way through, right, the lithosphere. Um, and that's how we have that modeled um, in Alaska for the Denali Fault, um, whereas other studies suggest um, that it, maybe it's only like 40 or, you know, 20 kilometers or so deep. But um, yeah. That's, yeah, something that I should definitely um, read up on. If you have any papers, please share them my way. Thank you. Uh, Magalie, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Kirstie, thank you for a wonderful uh, talk. It's really um, uh, a nice ex uh, set of experiments really to pin down exactly how this variation in strength changes in a great comparison to, to data to really get that um, nailed down. So thank you. My, my, my question, um, because you talked a little bit about the Yakutat, adding that mm -hmm. in as the next step, is um, do you envision that this higher coupling is, is due to the buoyancy of the Yakutat, or is it some other process or both? And does that, does the high, I should have said high coupling, does the high viscosity shear zone region, does it coincide really just with where Yakutat is, or does it need to go beyond that? Hmm, these are great questions. Okay, um, so let, let me start with the first part. So the Yakutat Oceanic Plateau um, and how I, and if that one would increase the coupling, I think is what you're getting at there. And so I, I do think that when you have these huge, right, compositionally buoyant features subducting, um, you, you do naturally get an increase in coupling to the overriding plates. Um, so I do believe that the Yakutat Oceanic Plateau and the compositional buoyancy of that um, will inherently increase coupling to the upper plates. Um, but I, I know there's also been studies that looked at tectonic tremor and slow slip in Alaska within that area, um, suggesting that there's a lot of fluids subducting with the plateau and the fluids are being released and really weakening the plate. So I think there's a lot of trade-off um, when we're talking about uh, buoyancy um, and, and, and coupling. And, you know, maybe things are, are highly coupled, right, due to the buoyancy or due to the geometry, um, but they might not be as, as, I guess, strong, if that makes sense. And they might be able to, to kind of move or slide because the interface is weak. Right. Um, and then um, to your second question, I'm sorry, can you please uh, restate that one for me? So um, I was wondering, in your models, you have this region of sort of higher coupling or mm -hmm. higher viscosity, which you need in order to fit the, um, the microplate rotation. And does that <coughs> coincide with where you think the Yakutat block is or go beyond that? So now I'm trying to look at this better. Um, so how far, how large is that, that, that area of increased coupling? Yeah, okay, good question. Yeah, so our area of increased coupling spans about 10 degrees longitude right now. Um, so we just did something um, quite quite simple where we just kind of took um, an edge here of uh, I guess the max western extent of where the plateau would be and kind of brought that down as an area of where we would increase coupling. Um, and then we just also I kind of shut it off here. So the Yakutat, there's this part offshore um, right here that's actually colliding uh, with the plate. And then we have this part right here um, that's, uh, I guess, beginning to kind of under thrust, right, and subduct a little more. And so we kind of took that um, as our edge of where we see the, or where we impose the local increase in tectonic coupling. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, there's another question in the chat uh, from Ichin. Uh, how does the lithospheric thickness uh, thicknesses of both the microplate and the upper plate affect the results? Hmm. Um, yeah, so the lithospheric thickness of the upper plate and microplate, um, I have not played around with various thicknesses um, um, of those. So for the thicknesses, we are using um, the elastic, uh, this already like thermal model. Um, so this upper plate um, was put together by uh, Margaret Jadamak, my PhD advisor, um, during her PhD work, um, where she um, gathered a, a, a lot of data um, to kind of, including heat flow data, to constrain the thickness of that upper plate. Um, and that was something that I have not uh, played around with. So a good question. That would definitely be something um, that we could test moving forward. Um, and I know that uh, there are some, you know, with more observations and data becoming available in Alaska, um, that's definitely something, um, upper plate thickness, that can be better constrained. So definitely something for future studies to investigate. Um, thank you. Can I ask, I guess, another clarifying question yeah. about the, um, the, the increase in viscosity here? Is it, uh, I guess, along like the whole subducting slab or just over the extent to which it should be coupling with like the overriding plate? And I probably missed. Yeah, like. I guess oh no, you're fine. Yeah, that's a good question. These models are, are so are so complex. So I know it's it's, it's easy to to get lost. Um, so yeah, so here, um, this is the area where we have our plate boundary shear zone. So when we're locally increasing the viscosity, um, we're just increasing the viscosity of this area here um, between the upper and downgoing plates. Thank you. Yes, it's clear in this figure. I was like, I just was trying to wrap my head around the 3D nature. Oh, yeah. Um, are there other questions? I will, I will ask one more about, um, uh, given that it's a 3D study, um, so you take uh, your model down to a depth of uh, 1,500 kilometers. Do you think having more of the mantle would in any way influence these results or a more of an extent, uh, I guess, like how do you deal with, for example, um, boundary conditions on the side? Yeah, okay. Or let me go back to here. Okay. <laughs> so right here, what we're looking at here is the extent of, I guess, the lateral extent of the model. Um, so uh, yeah, the depth does go down to 1500 kilometers, right? So um, we have the upper mantle and the lower mantle in the models. I, I don't, I'm not sure that increasing depth would have much of a change um, since we just have our composite viscosity um, variations in the upper mantle. Um, and kind of, we're just looking at, at the dynamics within that area. So within like the upper 400 kilometers. Um, but I do think that we, there might be some changes specifically um, in the upper mantle flow field if we move the boundaries um, of these models out. Um, so yeah, I think um, that's something, especially if we're trying to, uh, you know, better constrain the mantle flow and the 3D flow around the edge of the slab in this area, um, then moving out the boundaries. Um, I, I anticipate that would definitely have an effect on the flow field, yes. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? All right, well, uh, if not, let's thank Christy again. Uh, great talk. Make sure, yes. <laughs> I'll clap for everyone again. I think there's a little <laughs> clapping in some of them, yeah. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs>